History has shown us what greed can do to the sports card hobby. We've got a set deal that we're gonna do for just a few people that is one of those that absolutely makes no sense <laughs> whatsoever. See the 90s overprinting issues that coined the era of the junk wax. Spending boxes and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen factory sets, seventeen, eighteen vending boxes, and a rack box. Nineteen sets and boxes, barely ten dollars a set. Barely ten dollars a set. Current reports state that there are over 1 million cards in the PSA backlog, and over 80% of those are modern and ultra modern cards, i.e., 2012 to present. However, this does not dissuade me from investing in cards. It actually forced me to reflect and diversify my knowledge base around the hobby, look further into the core of the hobby. And at the core is the pure collector, somebody that appreciates and values the card just as much if not more than the player on it. And the rarer the card, the sweeter it is in the collection, which is why I feel the safest, note I didn't say the best ROI short term, but the safest sports card investments right now are the holy grail cards of the hobby. And we already know most football cards are egregiously underpriced compared to their baseball and basketball counterparts, which presents us with some incredible buying opportunities. After all, we know here on the Quest that football is the greatest show on turf. All of which is why I've spent hundreds of dollars, my biggest purchase yet on one single card that I'm gonna share with you in this video, as well as talk about what the Holy Grail cards are some challenges when it comes to buying them how to overcome those challenges so let's dig in holy grail cards you're probably wondering which ones are those those are mostly vintage now you may be asking yourself what is considered vintage i was originally going to say everything made before 1985 because that's when i was born season in the 1984 season dan marino became the first quarterback to ever top 5,000 yards passing but no can do because of one mega iconic rookie card from the 1986 top set. And that is probably the best wide receiver to ever play the game. And of course, I'm talking about Jerry Rice and his iconic rookie card is the 1986 tops. Not to mention Steve Young in that set rocking the Bucks uniform. Come on, guys. Of course, we dropped them in 86. We were a bunch of jackasses back then. So to summarize what I feel is vintage, everything before 1986, because that was really when they started overprinting. The hobby started accelerating, which earned them the junk wax era term. We've got a deal right now. Absolutely makes no sense <laughs> whatsoever. So everything before 1986, that goes all the way back to the very first card uh, players in their Ivy League uniforms, this card of Harry Beecher from 1888. And these cards uh, from other Ivy League players in 1894 when they put them in cigar and cigarette packs. And these are extremely rare. And of course, I'm gonna give you a rundown of all the Holy Grail sets and cards and players because I'm awesome, but I also feel that if I do, you'll hit that like button. Now, before you run to eBay and go try and buy a Jerry Rice or Steve Young rookie card, that iconic set, hear me out because there are some serious challenges to buying these cards on a deal buying vintage cards anywhere for that matter these cards because of their scarcity and because of how far back they go and the hall of fame status around these players have a much higher likelihood of being altered being reprints being fakes there's been a lot of reports of people trimming cards with scissors to get those sharp corners that kind of thing you know so because the further we go back, the more scarce these cards become, buying them from a reputable graded company like PSA, BGS, SGC, and, and BGS had different names back then. You can look for BCCG and BV. Some of these players that I'm going to mention in this video 
still hold records to this day. You know, it makes their feats that much more impressive. Myself being an average Joe investor collector, I initially set out learning more about my own Tampa Bay Buccaneers football history. Coming into the league as an expansion team in 1976, actually placed in the AFC West with the Seattle Seahawks being placed in the NFC. It was such an ugly entry. Bunch of UCLA rejects beaten. In there blocking us. He hadn't blocked a guy in 12 years. Woo! The Bucks were the only expansion team to lose every game an entire season. And until the 2008 Lions, only the 1976 Bucks were completely winless. And we actually had a lot of hype coming into that first season. We acquired one of the biggest contracts in the NFL, signing. John McKay from USC who took them to three national championships. We won a preseason game against the Atlanta Falcons, so we had a lot of confidence going into the regular season. We spent our number one first round draft pick on defensive end Leroy Selman, and then in the secondary rounds, they had an extra pick of lesser talented veteran players from all the other teams in the NFL, kind of like the guys that they were cutting from their teams. They had a secondary pick for us and the Seahawks to fill out our teams. After I cured my collector's itch by looking at what 1976 Topps football cards with Buck players had to offer me, which was pretty cool and it's very inexpensive. So I was like, that's, that's, but I had to cure my investor itch, right? So now my investment wheels were spinning and with the 1976 season fresh in my head, the first website I visited was the Pro Football Hall of Fame Monitor. And it jumped off the page at me. Maybe the best running back to ever play the game of football. The highlight reel on sweetness shows one of the most elusive, toughest, and most versatile backs in the NFL has ever seen. He is the second most rushing yards of all time, only behind Emmitt Smith. And he's all-time top three in all pro and pro bowl selections top three in rushing attempts and top three in games started heck he played 184 games 12 straight seasons without missing a single game today we're reminded of him every year through the walter payton man of the year award an all-time great highlight reel so doing some additional research on beckett.com and allvintagecards.com. They had some great articles about the hobby and what cards the hobby holds highly coveted. And his 1976 Topps rookie card is not super rare by PSA means. PSA has graded roughly 8,800 copies, but this is one of the most sought after cards in the hobby, especially in a PSA 9 or 10. Now I wanted to make sure that I avoided buying reprints, fakes, and or altered cards, so I purchased a PSA graded version. All right, here is the actual card. And I had to dig through about 10 eBay packages to find this, but we found it. Just examining the condition of this card here, it's a it's a VG, very good to excellent PSA 4, but with the MK, that's a qualifier for a mark. And you can see the centering's pretty good. I like the front, that's in good condition. Then we flip it over. We flip it over to the back here, and you can see the mark right above my finger there. You can see the mark right next to where it says Walter, the W. It's like a little pen mark, like somebody started it right there. Whoa, what the hell are you doing, man? Don't mark on that's a Walter Payton rookie card. The nines and tens of this card are very rare and very expensive. And as they go up in value, all levels of his cards should go up and they're not going to get more common. Let's put it that way. <laughs> so an important note I learned about this, that the MK marking on under the grade here is why I got this deal. And it stands for mark qualifier. It has been marked up by a pen or some other kind of mark. I couldn't see any markings in the eBay listing. And I did send this seller additional questions because he originally had the wrong picture listed for the sale. He had a Dan Marino rookie card. So I thought maybe that's why the card hadn't sold. And when he relisted the new Walter Payton picture, I felt comfortable purchasing that from him. He was uh, prompt in his communication. And so I immediately pulled the trigger. But the fact that it has that qualifier will tend to knock that down a couple grades. So the qualifiers on the PSA card means that the card meets all criteria for the grade given, in this case a five, but fails the standard in one area. For example, a card which exhibits all the quality of a near mint to mint PSA eight, but is 90 to 10 centered left or right, will receive a grade of NMNT8 
with OC. The OC I've seen a lot stands for off center. Here's a brief list of all the qualifiers. OC, off center, ST, stain, PD, print defect, OF, out of focus, and MK, mark. Now, if you want a higher risk but a higher reward, you can gamble by buying raw vintage cards to get graded. And I'm all about this as well. As long as the seller has great reviews and the photos are very clear and detailed. And look, I can message the seller and ask for better pictures and or additional information regarding the card that will make it worth the risk. And sometimes I can feel you find incredible deals on some pretty rare vintage cards just doing your due diligence and just taking that risk. But as long as you get really good pictures and just have a realistic understanding of what that card sells for and a low PSA grade so you can compare it to what a potential raw uh, card would be and most investors in the marketplace today even collectors are pretty savvy because we have so much resources at our fingertips on the internet you can find price comps for that card you know you can easily go to ebay recently sold they can see that card sold for 150 dollars raw so why are they listed for 20 dollars? they're not that dumb most of the time when you see that 10 to 20 dollar raw vintage card that's going to be your reprint your fake your altered card and if that seller has bad reviews you know look at their experience level reach out to them heck do your due diligence to the point where you feel comfortable spending that amount of money and of course never spend your lunch money do you not yourself when you don't so ultimately i feel even though modern and ultra modern card investing and flipping is so exciting um, and i love prospecting because it correlates so well with fantasy football and i love playing fantasy football uh, but i feel it's very important to diversify our portfolio i look at all the cards that we own that we buy and sell as a portfolio and I think it's important to diversify between modern, ultra modern cards and with ultra rare, scarce cards that we know aren't going to quadruple or quintuple in population report within the next year makes sense to me. And these are cards that the hobby holds highly coveted and they're only going to just go up in the long run in value. These are cards that are set in stone. So needless to say, this is where my vintage quest started. But then I started thinking, man, the Cowboys dominant run and when they became in 1979 when they became America's team who they had on their team with Roger Staubach and Tony Dorsett um, and, and Roger Staubach rookie card is another one of those iconic cards that is highly coveted within the hobby and I feel compared to their baseball and basketball counterparts of these guys these all-time greats they're they're underpriced they're undervalued which presents some really nice buying opportunities and long-term investment opportunities for us and I would say you know, focus your investment dollars on this if you want to make uh, an income every month, but take some some profits and some money from your ultra modern investments and flipping and put that back into ultra vintage cards. Maybe the best time to do this is when the football cards after the football card season starts, you make a nice profit at the beginning of the season and all that hype and then take some of that money in October and buy vintage cards uh, but looking now at these deals that I'm finding incredible deals on a lot of vintage cards compared to basketball and baseball counterparts of guys that would be equally as great this is certainly not where my vintage quest is going to stop I've spent countless hours studying all the best players and sets dating all the way back to 1888 the first football card ever discovered Harry Beecher from Yale so join me next time to see where the vintage quest for football card glory goes but also we've got a tremendous mail day coming up several more mail days and i'm immediately stopping this and getting to work on that you never know what we're going to pull out of one of those packets you know so i'll see you there peace digging and diving and looking at hundreds of ebay listings every day I've